looks like most of the people are here. Um, thanks everybody for coming back today. Yesterday was a great session. We had five really cool presentations and hopefully we'll have some new ones today. This is actually a new topic that I have not explored yet with SM, so I'm excited for this. And if at any time there are any questions or stuff that comes up, please put them in the Q&A box, the chat box, and we will look at them as we go along. So we can get started. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm Dr. Allison Miller. I am a licensed psychologist in the Baltimore, Maryland area. Um, and I work with children, teens, and adults um, on a variety of concerns, particularly um, um, anxiety disorders and particularly selective mutism. Um, I'm so excited that we have an individuals with selective mutism track this year. I am um, really happy to be able to talk to you about um, a therapy approach that you may or may not have heard of. Um, I know that if you were attending yesterday, you were learning um, about cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy is related. It is um, another evidence-based um, behavioral treatment, but I, in the last five or six years, as I have been um, learning and utilizing acceptance and commitment therapy in my own practice with um, my clients, have just found it to be incredibly rich and to sort of fill in um, blanks that CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy might leave us with. Um, so, I, what I decided after I found out that I wouldn't be able to see my audience or do any of the normal, more interactive things I'm used to doing in my talks um, was to try to give you as broad and, and um, complete an overview of acceptance and commitment therapy as possible so that um, if you are interested in this approach, um, you will be able to really understand what it would be like to work with a therapist who uses this and um, you actually, it doesn't even need to be thought of as just a therapy approach. Um, it's really kind of an approach to life that you can read books about. There are websites and I have resources at the end of my talk today. Um, of course, I'm a therapist and I think uh, the support of a therapist is wonderful, but it's also something that you can pursue on your own. So I am gonna be giving you a lot of information um, and asking you to participate um, on your side of the screen in some of the experiential tasks that I'm going to, or experiences that I'm going to be um, taking you through. And I kind of realized the silver lining of not being able to see anyone and not being able to do more of the interactive stuff that I love is that it might um, make it more likely that those of you um, here at this talk will actually try some of these things as I'm taking you through them. Um, so rather than having to worry about um, sort of like, are people watching me? What do I look like while I'm doing this? Hopefully in the comfort of your own home um, or wherever you are, you can uh, sort of just relax into trying some of the things that um, I'll be presenting. So um, the last thing just wanna say before I move on is unlike many of the other treatment approaches that have long names that we um, abbreviate by saying the letters like cognitive behavioral therapy is CBT, dialectical behavioral therapy is DBT, um, acceptance and commitment therapy is referred to as ACT. So we don't say ACT, we say ACT. And I hope by the end of this presentation, you will um, really appreciate how appropriate um, that abbreviation is. Um, and so when I'm saying ACT, I'm referring to acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, <clears throat> so I know that we have people from all sorts of time zones. I'm on the East Coast, so um, it's 10.06 here. But I know for some of you, you may be on the West Coast. It may be, you know, just sunrise. Some of you may be in other parts of the world where it's dark. Um, I want to kind of just like wake us all up. I thought this was a beautiful, um, you know, just visual to have. I want to take us into the first experiential exercise. This is something that I do with my clients all the time um, in session, and I encourage them to do um, on their own. So. Um, first, before we dive into it, I'm just going to 
have us take a nice deep breath. Um, if you feel like closing your eyes, please do. I am going to close my eyes because that's how I do it. So nice deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. Just feel a little bit of that relaxation. <clears throat> and now what I want you to do is look around the space that you're sitting in. So look beyond the screen and look around you and I want you to name, either in your mind or out loud, five things that you see. So just five different objects as you look in your space that you can see. And now I want you to name four things that you physically can feel touching your body. So whether it's the floor beneath your feet, whether it's your um, <clears throat> the, the seat or couch that you're sitting on, um, the feeling of clothes or something that you're holding, four things that you feel. And now I want you to be quiet for a moment and name three things that you can hear. The next one is two things that you smell. And one thing that you taste whether that's your morning coffee, brushed your teeth, whatever you just ate, one thing that you taste. What we just did is called a grounding exercise. I call it five senses grounding. Um, here you see it um, labeled as five, four, three, two, one grounding. Um, <clears throat> but it's an example of a grounding exercise. If we were together, I would ask for um, people to sort of share what that was like for them. Um, I can't do that. So I'm just gonna say that typically in a session, the first time I do that with a client and we discuss what it was like for them, um, they say that um, they noticed that their mind sort of dropped all of the chatter that might've been going on. And they were just very focused on um, these questions that I was asking them which connected them to their five senses. And um, the reason it's called grounding is because what it does is it helps us just connect and center um, on what is happening right now, rather than being caught up um, in our minds in worries about the future or um, thoughts about the past um, or to-do lists, things, you know, that just kind of like are constantly there. Um, grounding is an example of a mindfulness practice or a mindfulness exercise. And you've probably heard um, about mindfulness. It's been pretty popular and trendy in the last few years. Um, a lot of people equate mindfulness with meditation and they are related, but not the same. So it's possible to practice mindfulness by doing meditative sorts of exercises. Um, but the one that we just did, a grounding exercise, is not meditative at all. And so um, mindfulness is a very broad um, area of, of tasks and um, strategies and practices that you can do. And what it refers to is returning to the present moment, being here now. Um, and it is one of the main tenets of acceptance and commitment therapy. So by the end of my talk today, you will have an outline of five of the main um, pieces of ACT. So mindfulness is the first one. Um, we're gonna do another exercise. And uh, this one is not about being in the present moment. It's actually about um, using your imagination and um, very different. So, oh, I forgot to mention at the beginning that if you have a paper and pen or pencil handy, that would be really great because I am going to want you to write a couple things down. Um, you can, of course, type on your device if you don't have anything to write with, but if you have something nearby you want to grab, that would be great. Um, 
so in this one, and again, this is using our imagination and this is um, one of the really uh, famous <laughs> or, or commonly used exercises in ACT. I want you to imagine um, your ideal birthday party. So what would that look like for you? Where would it be? What would the decorations look like? What would the food be? What would your cake look like? Um, but there's a little bit of a catch because this isn't just any birthday party. This is your 75th birthday party. Um, I'm going to assume that most of the people on this talk are probably nowhere near 75 years old. So definitely take some imagination. Um, this isn't your 21st, your 25th. Um, this is far in the future and um, hopefully, you know, still have some good years left, but in the, the latter part um, of your life. So you can kind of look back um, on your life at this point. In, in addition to what this party would look like and what the food would be, I want you to think about who would be there. And because we're using our imagination, we can actually have anyone we want there, even people who are no longer with us. So beloved grandparents, um, if you have other uh, people in your life that probably would, would not um, still be with us um, by the time you're 75 or may have already passed, um, the people who are important to you. So family members, dear friends, um, et cetera. So I want you to just think for a minute who would be there. That's my slide, whoops. Um, and now I want you to imagine that some of them are going to give a toast. They're gonna um, speak about you. What would you want them to say? So here you are, 75, you've lived a lot of your life. Hopefully you've accomplished um, some things. You have become the person that you want to be. What would you want them to say? Would you want to hear that you've been a wonderful friend? Would you want to hear that you have accomplished um, some wonderful you know, professional goals? Um, that you have been a leader, um, you know, it's, it's very individual. Jot down a few things, just a few phrases. Who would you want to be at this point in your life? And if you have a few thoughts about that, I want you to take a look at this not exhaustive by any stretch list of values. All right, so um, see here a wide range, but feel free to come up with your own. Um, if you can sort of translate what you would hope people would be saying about you at your 75th birthday party into what you value about being a human what makes you you or who do you want to be? Um, so if, if you wanted people to say that you were a great friend, um, you might choose the values of um, love and caring. Um, I think compassion is on here somewhere. Um, if you were thinking about you know, wanting to be successful in your career, um, and, and all, also these don't have to be mutually exclusive, so you can have Several, of course, because we usually don't have only one thing that's important to us. Um, but if you, you know, success, maybe um, accomplishment, leadership, um, success. So I want you to write down a few, at least three, um, five would be even better things that are meaningful to you. All right, so let's hope you had some time to jot a few down. You can still be thinking about it. Values are the second um, tenet, I guess, of acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, a really important piece of the work is connecting with what's important to me. I can't tell you, no therapist can tell you, no family member can tell you, um, or teacher or anyone, what is important to you and who you want to be. And 
this process in ACT is a really um, crucial and meaningful time. And we definitely do it not, not nearly as quickly as I just went through that with you. This would be something that would be evolving and we would really be digging into it um, because we, we can't really make decisions about how we wanna move forward in our lives unless we've connected with who we want to be and why, what's important to us. So mindfulness, being able to be present in the here and now and knowing what's important to us as individuals, two important pieces of ACT so far. The next one, um, if you attended any of the talks yesterday that um, went over cognitive behavioral therapy uh, strategies or CBT, um, I'm going to weave some of that in. So you would have learned about um, how important it is to recognize um, thinking traps, thought holes, um, distorted thoughts. People use all sorts of different terminology for that, but um, uh, thought patterns that are not helpful to us. So things like catastrophizing, mind reading, all or nothing thinking, um, lots of future telling. So these hopefully are familiar, whether it's from a talk you um, attended yesterday or maybe work in therapy in the past. Um, I'm going to take that a little further. So in CBT, we want to recognize, um, you know, our unhelpful thinking patterns and name them. Um, and we want to work on changing them. And that's actually a little bit of a, a departure with ACT. So we'll get into that a little later. Um, with ACT, we're doing a lot of what we call watching our thoughts, noticing our thoughts. Um, and so we're not just focused on the unhelpful ones, but all of our thoughts. So, no, I'm, I notice I'm thinking about food. I'm notice I'm feeling hungry. Oh, I, I noticed that I, um, you know, was just uh, caught up there for a minute in, you know, am I going to run over? Am I going to be able to fit everything in in the time that we have? Um, we're just watching our thoughts and I want you to start to imagine them as if they're like clouds in the sky. All right. So it's no um, coincidence that <laughs> I chose cloud-like thought bubbles um, because they really are. So clouds are real uh, they're there, you know, we can't argue with, with the fact that the thought is there, um, but it, they change, they morph, they flow, they come, they go. Sometimes there's a lot of thoughts. Sometimes there aren't very many. Um, we can pay a lot of attention to them, or we can just kind of have them be in the background. Um, our, our thoughts are like clouds. They're moving and changing. They're not always reflective of truth or reality. They certainly are not us. We are separate from our thoughts. Um, our thoughts happen to us just like clouds form in the sky and um, then go away. So uh, a big part of ACT is changing our relationship with our thoughts and starting to be able to watch them, notice them from a distance to be able to see them as separate from who we are. So they're like clouds, or you can think of thoughts being like cars that are going by. Um, again, they're, they're there. You can, you know, no one's going to tell you that they're not happening, um, but they're fleeting and they're transient and they're going by. So this is um, a, another super important piece of the work in ACT, which is to start to get really good at noticing thoughts, recognizing them as things that happen and change and move, and that they come and go. They're just, thoughts are thoughts. That's the thing we say, thoughts are just thoughts. Um, we can just watch them. We don't have to buy into them. We don't have to let them control us. Um, I know that's easier said than done, um, but this is important work that people um, do when they're working and act. Thoughts are just thoughts. And when you are, sorry, when you are um, practicing this noticing and separating from thoughts, you're working on um, a skill called diffusion. Um, so it references that instead of being fused with your thoughts, meaning that 
they, you are one in the same, your thoughts are your reality, um, that you really don't recognize them as separate from who you are. Um, you're going to separate from them. Here's you, here's your thoughts, and that's called diffusion. There are lots of strategies to practice diffusion. Diffusion is a skill to have, and there's many, many ways to do it. I'm not going to go into them because we don't, it's, you know, this is a very brief <laughs> overview, um, but there are a lot of like really cool, interesting diffusion strategies that we can use. Um, but the third, you know, super important uh, piece of act. All right. The fourth, this is in the name. This is acceptance. All right. So acceptance and commitment therapy obviously is going to involve um, some acceptance and um, I'm actually going to show a YouTube video in a moment um, that helps to illustrate one aspect of acceptance. And I want to be very clear about this because um, it's easy to kind of get a little, like to kind of scoff at this, like, oh, I'm just supposed to accept everything. Um, no, not at all. And like I said, the reason we, or, or, or the, I love that we call act, act because as you'll see soon, it isn't about just sitting back and like letting life happen to us, but there does have to be a measure of acceptance of um, unpleasant thoughts, unpleasant feelings, unpleasant circumstances that um, we can't necessarily change. And that if we get too caught up in um, fighting against or struggling with our thoughts, our feelings, our unpleasant, like bodily sensations um, that we're really not able to accomplish other things that are important to us. Um, and so we need to work on dropping that struggle. And um, here is one way to think about that. So um, this is a YouTube video. Russ Harris is one of the big act gurus. He is one of my favorites. I just absolutely love his accessible language, his amazing use of metaphor. Um, he's really, he has a great sense of humor. I love the way he um, can just like reach us on a level that we're like, oh, I totally get that. Um, and so I highly recommend his books, his, his many YouTube videos, and um, you will have access to lists of those um, at 11 a.m. when my materials become available. I didn't want you guys reading through stuff. I wanted you to be like here with me and mindfully connected to what we're talking about. So I didn't make my materials available yet, um, but they will be um, as soon as our, my talk is over. So then I really encourage you to go in and download those. But let's see what Russ Harris has to say about struggling. It often seems like we've got a struggle switch at the back of our mind. And as soon as an uncomfortable emotion, a painful feeling or memory shows up, it's like the, the struggle switch goes on and we start to struggle with it. So let's suppose anxiety shows up, a very common painful emotion that we all get to experience. Anxiety shows up, the struggle switch goes on. Oh, here's anxiety. I don't like anxiety. I want to get rid of my anxiety. Now I've got anxiety about my anxiety. So it's getting bigger. With the struggle switch on, I now get, oh, my anxiety is getting bigger. How do I get rid of my anxiety? Now I've got even more anxiety. With the struggle switch on, I may then get angry about my anxiety. Why does this anxiety keep showing up? I hate this anxiety. Then I might even start to feel sad about my anger. Oh, is this my life? Oh, and then I may start to feel guilty about my sadness, about my anger. Oh, how pathetic am I when there's starving kids in Africa? So with my struggle switch on, my emotions get amplified. I've now got guilt about my sadness, about my anger, about my anxiety, about my anxiety. And that kind of amplification of emotions gives them more impact and influence over my life and often gets me bogged down or pulls me into self-defeating behaviors. Now, what happens if I can switch 
off the struggle switch. With the struggle switch off, anxiety shows up, and it's not that I like it or want it or approve of it. It's just I'm not going to struggle with it. I'm not going to invest my time, energy, and effort in struggling with this anxiety. Instead, I'm going to invest it in doing meaningful, life-enhancing activities, such as spending quality time with my friends and family or playing with my kids. Now, with the struggle switch off, the anxiety is free to move. It may get higher, it may get lower, it may move quickly, it may move slowly, but the point is it's free to move. It doesn't get amplified by all of these other emotions which make it kind of bigger and stickier and make it hang around for a lot longer. So there's no such thing as a life without anxiety, it shows up for all of us. But when anxiety shows up and the struggle switch is off, it's so much easier to live with than when the struggle switch is on. Okay. Got trouble advancing from this slide. Okay. Um, so I want to clarify or reiterate some of the um, concepts from that video, because I think it's really easy to um, kind of take away the wrong message. And I, I don't want that to happen. Um, the message here is not that there's a switch that you can just turn off your feelings. And um, I noticed that sometimes people might distill it down to that. Um, and then of course they feel really frustrated because that's the exact opposite of what we're saying. Um, the struggle switch is um, about whether we fight with our emotions as opposed to allowing them to be regardless of how uncomfortable they may feel. So when we feel anxious, it's really uncomfortable. No one likes it. We all know what that feels like. It's physically uncomfortable. It's mentally uncomfortable. It's emotionally uncomfortable. And um, when we start like beating ourselves up about it, um, or um, getting even you know more anxious that we have anxiety, we're really just, like he said, amplifying it. And so what we work on in ACT is being able to sit with the emotion um, without judgment, without arguing with it, um, without letting it overtake us and get bigger and bigger. So we practice, you know, what's it, what does it feel like to be anxious? And let's notice it. Oh, I have butterflies in my stomach. I feel sweaty. I have dry mouth. I'm shaky. Um, you know, my voice sounds weird in my head. It sounds higher. I always notice that. I feel like when I'm anxious, my voice sounds higher. Um, and, and we learn how to like, okay, that sucks. It doesn't feel good. Do we have to beat ourselves up about it? No, because that's not gonna help. Um, so a lot of work is done on um, how we accept difficult, painful emotions um, and also thoughts. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Please remember that you can ask any questions in the Q&A um, little icon there. And at the end, I will have time for questions and you can make them anonymous, I believe. Um, all right, so we've gotten through four of the five uh, main tenets of ACT that I'm going over today. Um, and so this last one, sorry, there we go. Um, and here I promised you that you would know why I like that we call ACT, ACT. And it is because <laughs> acting, taking action is um, a huge important piece of this work. Um, and Again, I'm so simplifying this just because this is a crash course, um, but basically what this looks like, and this would be work that you would do with a therapist or you could do it on your own, um, is that you may have heard of SMART goals um, and they are specific and measurable and you know other things. So we want to be um, very specific with our goal. It's not like um, I want to... Um, talk to everyone that I mean. Um, it needs to be like much more 
um, concrete and specific and super important, it needs to be based on your values. And so that's why that values work is so important because you're not just going to like willy nilly go choosing goals. You need to be able to connect to them because it's hard work to meet goals and it's painful sometimes. And so if you don't have some buy-in because there's something meaningful to you about it, it's highly unlikely that you're going to stick with it. Um, and so that's why it's so individual and it's so important that um, everyone does that preliminary values work. Um, we also need to be honest. And sometimes uh, it's, it's easy to sort of brush over things and be like, oh, I can totally um, you know, accomplish this, this, and this um, without having to do much you know, hard work or face, face my fears. Um, but that's not often true. So um, sometimes I have to work with my clients a lot on like, let's, let's be honest. So, you know, if, if your goal is to become a successful, whatever it is, you know, in your career, we probably have to face the fact that you are going to need to do interviews and you're going to need to network and you're going to need to be able to express your, your um, opinions your thoughts, um, you're going to need to advocate for yourself. And so there probably isn't a way to achieve that goal without becoming more comfortable um, speaking to you know, people that you're not as familiar with. So honesty is really important there. Um, and so once you've you know, identified your values, identified some goals that connect with those and are honest about what, what needs to happen, then we need to break it into smaller parts because you're probably not going to feel very motivated to do something that is going to be incredibly overwhelming in terms of the emotional um, piece. So we need to be thoughtful about how can I break this down so that yes, I am experiencing you know, some discomfort but it's not going to completely drown me where I'm going to get, say, forget this, you know, I'm going to give up. So I have um, an example, sorry. Um, so one of the things I end up working a lot on with my like older teen and, and young adult clients with selective mutism or social anxiety even is um, kind of taking the baton from their parents um, who have made all their appointments and interfaced with their providers and everything throughout their entire lives, which is normal. Um, but of course, as we grow into adulthood, we need to be able to take over and do those things independently. So a, an example of a goal would be to make a doctor's appointment yourself. Um, some have online scheduling, but for instance, my kid's pediatrician does not. So we have to call to make an appointment. Um, so you see some steps here. These are just ones I made up. Um, you would want to sit down and be thoughtful about what your ladder or your steps might look like. Um, and uh, you might have to repeat some of those steps. Like maybe you'd have to do, um, you know, this yellow one, do a mock call with a family member or somebody else several times to get used to it before you feel like you're ready to move on to the next one. Um, but this is an example of breaking it down into manageable pieces. So now we have all five of um, the parts of ACT that I wanted to go over. There are some other little ones in there, but I thought that you know, these are the ones I tend to focus on the most with my clients. And I think they're the most explainable in a short amount of time. So we have um, mindfulness, reconnecting with the now, as opposed to being in the future, in the past, which can bring up a ton of extra discomfort and worry. Um, being able to identify who do you wanna be? What's important to you? Um, what is going to guide your life? Who, you know, what are your values personally? Being able to notice your thinking and separate from it so that you aren't so fused with your thoughts that they control you. Um, you being able to recognize that you can have this thought and you can choose to respond to it in this way. You have free will. Your thoughts are just thoughts. Um, acceptance, where we're not spending so much of our time and energy struggling with or judging or evaluating our you know, internal um, experiences. We are allowing them to be and moving forward in action. Um, so choosing behaviors um, that reach our values-based goals. So again, please feel free to throw any questions in there. 
Um, all right, so I've in record time, <laughs> usually this is like weeks of sessions, you know, so session after session of kind of going through this. So please, if you're like, whoa, this is a lot of information, you're right, it is a lot of information. Um, so I, you know, I hope it's helpful. Um, okay, so you may have noticed on the first slide, uh, the title slide that there was a lighthouse and a boat, and you might have been like, what the heck, what it, why does this lady have a nautical theme for this? And you're about to find out. Um, ACT is full of metaphors. And, and I love that it uses metaphors because um, we can really sometimes like see things in a new perspective and, and connect with them in a way that we couldn't when they were just explained like the way I just explained them. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take the information that I've given you so far and I'm going to put it in the context of one of the, the most, I think, widely used metaphors in acceptance and commitment therapy. And this is called the lighthouse metaphor. Um, also, this uh, I made this presentation using Canva. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but I've always done PowerPoint. And I got so excited about all of the options that Canva gives, like the animation and all the cool graphics. Um, and since there is no interaction here and I'm like just talking to myself is what it feels like to me. I know there, that you're out there, but I thought, well, I wanna make this kind of exciting. Um, and so I threw a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> so feel free to chuckle at me if you're noticing that I have a lot of elements, but I wanted to, again, kind of make it like interesting visually um, and a little fun. So here's my big experiment with Canva, the lighthouse metaphor. Um, so we're going to just kind of say that um, life is like a giant ocean. All right, um, there is, it's, it's vast and large and there are a lot of ways to go and there's a lot going on like below the surface. Um, and we are each the captain of our individual vessel. So here you get a sailboat. Um, so we are captaining our sailboat through the ocean of life, all right? And um, here's our lighthouse and uh, we, I'm sorry, I want to go back for a second. So in, in this, you know, picture, there is really like no destination. Okay, so it's sort of like random, you're just floating around, where are you going to go? Um, and that's where our lighthouse comes in. So, um, oh, off in the distance, now we have a destination. We have um, this lighthouse beaming out light, and the lighthouse is going to represent our values, all right? So go back to those values that you jotted down before at the beginning and um, imagine that they're placed here, um, beaming out at you across the ocean, um, beckoning you this way, this is the way towards your values. This is where you wanna be headed, all right? Um, so I just threw in some, this is, you know, random. These values could be anything that is important to you. So um, this is what might be leading some people. Um, some, I think that a lot of these reflect my values. And we're gonna imagine it's sunny and clear and the water is calm and it's a beautiful day. Um, and it's just, you know, a nice, easy boat ride over to the lighthouse, um, really easy to get there. And we're gonna head over there and we're gonna arrive um, at, wow, you know, I met, met a goal that really is um, in keeping with my values of um, success and independence. And I, I feel so fulfilled and isn't life wonderful. All right, so that's, that's great. But here's the catch. The weather is not always beautiful. In fact, the weather can be really crappy. Excuse my, <laughs> this is how I talk to my clients. The weather can be really not nice. Um, and uh, it can be stormy and it can be dark. And um, it's not so easy to steer our vessel, our boat in the direction of our values when the weather is not so great. Um, so the weather in this metaphor is like our thoughts and feelings. It's always changing, right? Sometimes it's beautiful and nice. You wake up, it's a great day, but it's not always. 
um, our thoughts and feelings are not always pleasant. They're not always helpful. In fact, a lot of times they're really unhelpful. Um, we definitely can't control the weather um, and we can't control our thoughts very well, if at all. Um, we can control our feelings to some degree in some ways that are more healthy than others. Um, but, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to control our thoughts and feelings. And um, as you were seeing with the struggle switch video, a lot of times that is almost wasted energy and it can make things worse. So you see it's gotten dark. Um, some rain is starting to fall. And as this happens, um, our lighthouse over here um, can start to get tougher to see, might fade a little bit. You see, okay, so we're gonna imagine that these clouds are some upsetting, difficult thoughts. No one likes me, I'm a failure. The lighthouse is fading, it's getting even harder to see. Now it's raining. Um, the rain is getting in our eyes, it, it's painful, it's cold, um, the, the waves are getting choppier and that lighthouse is really, really um, obscured through the fog and the rain. And now we're gonna have some wind kick up. And that wind is going to tell us like, you know, there's no point, you can't do this. And this is a visual of what it's like to be stuck. You're just stuck far away from your values and the goals associated with them. And it feels miserable. And this is where strategies that we learn in acceptance and commitment therapy come into play. So first, you see the lighthouse there. I, if you can tell, I made it brighter. We need to reconnect. We need to re-see what those values are, where are we headed? What are we doing? What, what's important, all right? All these clouds and rain and this wind is trying to keep me from seeing what's important, but I am going to re-clarify and recommit to those values. So noticing the lighthouse, finding out what it is that drives you, all right? And now I'm gonna bring in some more tools and strategies. And the first one, I'm using a raincoat. This is going to be acceptance. And so yes, it is pouring rain and it is miserable. And so I'm gonna strap on my raincoat because I can't make it stop raining. So, all right, I'm gonna put my raincoat on here. I'm gonna accept that this feels miserable today and this weather is not good. And so I'm not gonna cower from it and let it just stop me. I'm going to say, okay, I can handle this even though it feels really uncomfortable. And then I'm gonna give myself some goggles. And um, those goggles are going to represent diffusion, noticing those thoughts, those clouds. Oh, I see why I feel so miserable. The sky is full of clouds, it's pouring on me. I know why I feel so miserable. My mind is flooding me with all of these unhelpful thoughts and to bring in some CBT language, maybe identifying those different thinking traps that you might be falling into. So all or nothing, this is mind reading, I'm catastrophizing, oh, I'm stuck in some perfectionism or future telling, all right? So those goggles that are gonna like help you see more clearly, what is happening here? Oh, my mind is beating up on me right now. That's what's happening. And remember that wind that's keeping us stuck. We're fighting against it. We're gonna, have um, a strategy to deal with that. And that strategy is our action. Okay, so I made this a propeller. We need to sort of kick into gear. When the weather is beautiful, uh, we don't necessarily need a propeller. Like we're just gonna easily sail to where we want to go. But when it feels really hard and scary, sad, overwhelming, whatever it is, we need a plan, all right? So that's when we need to make those, you know, that ladder, those steps, we need to, create something concrete for ourselves. And that's the action. We're gonna imagine that's like the propeller. And as we utilize all these different pieces, because none of them will work on their own, typically, we need to act as like a puzzle. We have to have all the different pieces there. Once we're using all these pieces, we can start to make forward progress again. We're not stuck anymore. And Look, the weather, like I said, the weather is gonna change, right? We don't get stuck in the same weather. It's not like it's never ending. Our mind changes, our thoughts change, the weather changes. 
the rain stops, maybe it's still cloudy, there's a little bit coming down, the wind is dying down, but I'm getting closer and closer to what's important to me and I've arrived. Even through that storm, it wasn't easy, it wasn't pleasant, but I did it. I'm living my values, I'm following those values of whatever is important to me. And the rain has stopped, it's starting to lighten up. I'm here and eventually the sun comes back. It's gonna go away again, it's not permanent, but the sun comes back. We go through this over and over and over. This is the lot of humans. This is our, you know, we can experience wonderful things. And in order to experience those, we also experience a lot of pain and that's part of our, our journey in life. And so I wanna do another example using the lighthouse metaphor for the last thing before questions. That last one was really like kind of depression sort of that, that holds us. Um, but as we know, selective mutism is an anxiety disorder. And so I would imagine that most of you who are here watching have a lot of experience with anxiety. And so I wanna use anxiety, which often shows up as the what ifs, as this last example. So anxiety can feel like a wave. Um, it, it's terrifying, it, it's overwhelming, it's tall and it feels like it's all you see, it's all you feel, it's scary, all right? So if we were together, I'd say, who's experienced the what if waves? Um, my hand would go up and I would imagine that everyone's hand would go up, all right? Um, the what ifs and that, you know, the, the physical feelings start. Butterflies in the stomach, more thoughts. This is too hard, this is too scary, I can't do this, here's another wave. Oh my goodness, it's getting, you know, more kind of frantic feeling. Now I have even more physical symptoms. My heart is racing. I can't do this. Look at all these waves in front of me. How can you guys expect me to do this? Look how hard this is. This is too much. Now I don't know about you, but when I look at this screen, I feel anxiety. <laughs> it is, it's not soothing. And if you're feeling some of that right now, I'm not gonna apologize for it because it's actually a good practice. Notice what it feels like to you and notice that you can sit with it and it doesn't have to change what you're doing right now. It can just be, but this is a very anxiety provoking screen to me. So we're going to need a lot of determination here. Okay. We're going to have to recognize I need to, to utilize some, some tools and strategies here. This is, it's too hard otherwise, all right? So what am I gonna do? Well, this first one, I'm going to use the metaphor of a, a wheel or a rudder um, on, a, on a boat, okay? And that wheel is going to represent what we started with, which is grounding, okay? I need to whew, bring myself back to what's happening because I've been in the what ifs. I've been in all of this fear of the future. And I need to come back to what's happening right now and where I am and what I'm surrounded by and, and who I am and ground myself. So we're gonna stick that little grounding thing here on our wheel. And although we might still feel butterflies in our stomach, we might have those physical sensations, maybe it calms down a little bit. We, our, our frantic uh, cloud movement has stopped. So maybe I'm like, okay, I'm okay. I'm here in this moment. I'm okay, all right? I still have these scary waves coming, but I'm starting to use my tools. And I'm gonna move forward. And that moving forward is going to be a combination of acceptance that I have to go over this wave. I, you know, there, there's, there's no choice really, like, this scary wave is coming. And if I want to keep moving towards my lighthouse, towards my values, towards what's important, it's kind of obscured, but I can still see it. I'm going to have to go over and I'm going to have to feel it and feel that fear. And that's acceptance. 
And in order to do it, I'm going to have to have a plan. I'm going to have to break it into parts. I can't go over that third wave without going over the first wave and the second wave. So acceptance and an action plan. And it's going to start, I'm sorry, and one more. Um, and I'm going to get my goggles on again. All right. And so um, I'm going to, to label this is what if thing. This is catastrophizing. I'm noticing a lot of um, anxious thoughts right now. Um, and I can choose how to respond to those. So they can be there and I can choose what to do. And so I'm going to start to make my way. And I, um, sorry, <laughs> um, I can't see what's coming. So I forgot. Um, but reminding myself. With About the, 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, 10 minutes left. Reminding myself with those goggles uh, of diffusion and noticing that thoughts are just thoughts and feelings are not facts. So I'm going to be making my way slowly over these waves with all of my tools, my mindfulness, my diffusion and noticing, my acceptance of this is hard and scary. And here's my action plan. And as I'm going, maybe some of those physical feelings start to get better. Maybe they start to like calm down. Because I'm like, wow, I'm actually doing this. And now I'm going over that last wave, that really big one. And I'm, I'm there. I did it. It wasn't easy. It wasn't always pleasant. And I did it. And I achieved my goals that are in keeping with my personal values. And again, the sun comes back out until we start again. So... That is the lighthouse metaphor. I hope it helped to put into perspective all those different parts of ACT and solidify um, some of those um, strategies and pieces that I talked about. This is, you know, there's a lot going on here and um, this is going to be available for you to upload or, or sorry, download um, with the other, other things that I'm going to have available at 11 a.m. This is sort of the overview of it. All right, so the weather is always changing, as are our thoughts, our emotions, our physical sensations. We are the captain of our boat, um, and we can move forward even in bad weather towards that lighthouse of what's important to us if we have the right tools to do it and we actually use them. So the tools of acceptance, of diffusion, of mindfulness, which may, may involve grounding, and that's what's going to get us to where we need to be, even in those stormy times. All right, so we have a few minutes left. Um, John, I don't know if any questions came in. It was really great, thank you. Um, I loved all the animations. Okay. It, it paid off all your, your hard work, putting those together. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> we don't have any questions at the moment. Two people said, one person says they loved it. Another person said amazing metaphor, it's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad. If there's any final questions before we did a question pop up? Actually, looks like maybe one did. What are some strategies for diffusion? Thank you for asking. That's a wonderful question. Um, so there are so many. Some are a little silly um, and they look like um, so some people love these, but others hate them, which is totally, totally fine. Um, they look like um, turning our thoughts into less scary sounding versions of them. So for instance, um, if uh, one of our kind of repetitive, intrusive, upsetting thoughts is um, I'm a failure, that we can turn that into something that's more like sing song, um, or we can um, repeat it over and over and over in like a weird or funny voice so that it starts to lose meaning because when it sounds like this in our mind, I'm a, I'm a failure, I'm a complete failure. It's very, uh, you know, puts us back. It, it's, it sounds very commanding and real, but if we sort of like sing it like um, to the tune of happy birthday, like I'm a failure, oh yes, I'm a failure, oh yes it starts to lose some of the power. Um, so again, you would need a lot more like work and reading to, to kind of like, that's such a little snippet. Um, some people like that, some, some are like, that's terrible and I would never use that. Um, one that I use with my clients a lot is to identify 
a thought, so I'm a failure, and to put a phrase right at the beginning of it. And the phrase is, I'm having the thought that I'm a failure. I'm having the thought that I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'm having the thought that I can't do it. So I'm having the thought that, because what that does is it immediately helps you separate from the thought. It immediately helps you look at it for what it is. It's a thought. I'm having the thought. It doesn't mean it's true. It's a thought. So that's one that I use a ton with my clients and that people tend to feel um, is very powerful. It takes practice. Um, another diffusion technique is um, to name, to, to sort of like recognize um, difficult thoughts that hang together into themes. So um, it might be the theme of, um, I'm going to make a fool of myself when you have a lot of different thoughts that sort of like get at that and you name them something like that theme, you name it. And we call that naming it as a story. Oh, there's that. I'm going to make a fool of myself story again. Here it comes. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot more questions coming in, so I'm actually going to let you. Yes, I, I, we only have like two minutes left, but this is great that we got um, a bunch of these questions. I'm just going to go through them in order. Them too. Um, uh, it's hard for adults to find uh, clinicians who know how to work with SM. Do you have any suggestions trying to find support, even if it's just an anxiety therapist? Um. So finding, um, I'm sorry, was that an adult a therapist to treat adults with SM? Yes, hard to yeah. find treating clinician experience SM in adults. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, and so um, of course, uh, Selective Mutism Association um, website has treating professionals. And I would start there with seeing if anyone listed um, does has, treat adults um, like we do in my practice. And that would be the best way to do that. Um, and because we have more licensed mobility now, you may be able to find someone that can treat you via telehealth um, in a different state. So that's something to keep in mind because things are changing with that. Um, also, um, many therapists uh, who specialize in anxiety disorders in adults would be willing to learn about selective mutism. So you could always find um, an expert in um, just anxiety disorders and ask if they would be willing to do some reading and maybe you could um, you know, provide them with some good books. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I thought this was an interesting question. What are some ways to adapt these strategies for someone who is not yet verbal with, um, not yet verbal with their clinician yet due to SM for the strategies required to start with first versus others that require more verbal interactions? Yeah, well, I think that a lot of the preliminary work, so for instance, values, identification, practicing mindfulness strategies, um, those don't have to be verbal. But I would always recommend that um, part of the focus of therapy be on developing verbal comfort between the client and the clinician. So um, you can kind of be doing like a hybrid where you're working on both at the same time. But I think using um, just written, like writing down values, um, you know, practicing mindfulness techniques where they might be, uh, the client might be noticing um, things in their mind and then writing them down instead of verbalizing them. Um, I know we are, I just wanna quickly show you that um, what you can download um, at right in a minute is this, which shows all the components I talked about, um, a ton of resources, whether they're books, more videos, um, and then there is how to find a therapist who uses ACT. I can't say that they have SM expertise to speak to that other question, um, but certainly um, would have ACT expertise. And then this is a little worksheet that you can use um, to take the strategies that we talked about today and like put them into action for yourself. And then also I do have this graphic for you. And then I think um, values as well. Um, I have a, a values list. That's great. Um, Thank please, you for providing um, all that. My email is there. Um, please feel free to email me with any questions that I wasn't able to answer. Of course, I can't give personalized, like therapeutic sort of um, responses, but I can certainly give more information. So don't hesitate. I'm happy to respond um, to emails if anyone um, would like more information. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so yeah. We have a 10, 10 minute break now, and the next presentation is at 11.10, and see all the participants there. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.